Welcome everyone this to this afternoon's session, a uh, smaller session, um, about devices. Um, and I have the honor of introducing our moderator today, Dr. Nino Kiyoka. And uh, Dr. Kiyoka is the Harvey Cushing Professor of Surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And Harvey Cushing, um, you may know, was the surgeon who had the audacity to operate on the brain at the turn of the century. And Dr. Kiyoka, who's the present uh, neurosurgeon in chief and chief of neurosurgery at Brigham Women's Hospital, has the audacity to treat malignant brain tumors with viruses. And so he's carrying on Dr. Cushing's tradition in uh, really pushing the envelope forward. And I'm really pleased that Dr. Kiyoka is here to moderate the panel this afternoon. He will uh, introduce the rest of the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. It is a great pleasure to be here. And I also thank you, Monica, and the other organizers for setting up this great session. This is the device session. Most of the talks that we've heard have been on small molecules, immuno-oncology. Uh, as surgeons and as radiologists, Dr. Weissler is a radiologist, we're also very interested in devices. Um, how can we use devices for treating cancer, for diagnosing cancer? Uh, and, uh, and we've assembled here a great group of panelists to discuss that, and uh, I will lead the sessions, moderate the session, but if anybody has a question, please feel free to interrupt. So I'm gonna ask each one of the, our panelists to tell us a little bit about themselves and why they got interested in devices and what their, does their company do with devices. So starting you from the left. Dr. Kyoga, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Maurice Ferre. I'm the uh, CEO of a company called Insight Tech. Insight Tech is a company that has been around for 20 years, uh, based in Israel, focused on MR-guided focused ultrasound. And uh, it's been in the frontier, uh, closely working uh, with General Electric. And, um, and here, actually, at, at, at Harvard has been a very important uh, key place where a lot of the development and the technology has been done, first with uh, Dr. Frank Yoles and now with Dr. Claire Timpany. Um, and we're, we've developed a, a full platform technology. There's about 120 systems around, around the uh, worldwide, uh, ranging from the area of the brain uh, to prostate uh, to brain mets, of using inside an MR machine um, high intensity focused ultrasound to do both ablation and also things like cavitation and the ability to open up the blood brain barrier. Uh, I'm David Lee, the CEO of Lumicell. Uh, Nino asked uh, why I got interested in devices. Devices are pretty much all I can do. Um, I'm not a drug guy, and yet um, Lumicell has a combination drug, which is an imaging agent to help guide surgeons find cancer during surgery, and a handheld, very uh, high resolution device for finding small residual cancer. Uh, we have to find foci that are, uh, that can be as small as 100 microns, uh, and so it is a real challenge, and that's my interest. We're currently doing um, phase 2B at uh, MGH in breast cancer, and we've got uh, underway an approved FDA and IRB for GI, which will include uh, uh, colorectal, esophageal, and uh, pancreatic. And uh, we've worked with Nino, uh, getting ready to go into the uh, brain. And we expect to be doing uh, ovarian very soon. Uh, this project, I should say, was a um, project that started at the MIT Koch Institute. It was a spin out, that's where I worked, and I went with uh, Lumicell, and uh, um, as was um, some other really terrific projects that I was involved in. Please. Uh, my name's Amy Pollack. I'm a gynecologic surgeon by training, and I'm a chief medical officer at Medtronic. Uh, I, I work in the area of early technologies, so we're driven by the idea that the earlier you detect disease, the earlier you can identify it and obtain tissue for it, the easier it is to get to early treatment. And so I work all the way through that pathway. And the areas I work in are lung, liver, and GI, uh, none of it gynecology. 
And, uh, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here today be, to be able to talk about some of the interesting devices that we're using in all three of those areas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ralph Weisleder, I'm professor at Harvard Medical School. I'm a practicing interventional radiologist at Mass General Hospital. Um, I also do research, which is primarily focused in the diagnostic space in finding cancer in the body, finding them very early, and then pinpointing exactly where they are using imaging modalities. And um, I've been doing this for a long time, over 30 years, and so my laboratory and members um, of the team have developed um, over hundreds of imaging agents and imaging devices over the last two decades, broadly in the space of um, what's now called molecular imaging, um, but also optical um, imaging tools. Um, so we started what David is now testing in clinical trials was originated um, in our center almost 20 years ago when we discovered that one could actually see fluorescence in the near infrared deep in the body and that has sort of spawned that whole field of interoperative imaging. Um, Thank you. So I was going to start by providing a clinical rationale and a biologic rationale of why we want these devices or better imaging to detect cancer. And as a surgeon, I think that taking more cancer out is better for the patient, uh, but this is really per an assumption, um, and there are some people that uh, might uh, uh, have issues with that assumption. Uh, there are, for the type of cancer that I do, which is cancer of the brain, there actually is very good now level two evidence that the more tumor you get out, the better it is for patients. And therefore this idea of being able to detect what's tumor and what's normal and allowing us to detect um, even the microscopic disease so that we can remove it either by surgery or by radiation or whatever means you use um, seems to be benefit the patient. So knowing that, um, I was gonna have the first question to our panel which is, uh, we've talked, we started talking about fluorescence and using optical imaging that is something that is dear and near to my heart because I can see it and I can remove it. Uh, what have been the limitations uh, in this process? You've been working on this, Ralph, for 20 plus years. Uh, it sounds like simple, make something fluorescent, take it out. Why is it taking so long to finally see it in a clinical trial with Lumicell? Well, it took 18 years to find David. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, really? That's yeah. it. <laughs> you know, I... No, no. I, Maybe go to, ahead. Sure. The, you know, I think when you look, when people think about tumors, um, you know, they're thinking of the bulk tumor, and they think, oh, I've got um, a technology that can see a bulk tumor. And um, the difficulty is that surgeons are very good at getting the bulk tumor out. That's generally out sitting on the table. The, the real issue is the microscopic residual cancer, the small foci that are left. And these might be foci of um, in the thousands of cells, not millions. And so you have to design an imaging agent as we choose to do and a device that's going to find microscopic cancer uh, in, in vivo. And I think that there's been a lot of false starts um, over the years because people start off thinking, oh, I can see this large tumor, but when they get down to residual cancer, it's a much bigger challenge. And if I can follow up with that, so you know, for the type of cancer I, I mentioned, which is glioblastoma, yeah. there is actually an imaging agent that's used in Europe. It's not FDA approved in the States, but there you can usually use it under an IRB, which is this 5-ALA. Right. Uh, how does, uh, why, why, what is the difference between 5-ALA and other fluorescent molecules that you can use? So, um, you know, I, I guess we would break down, and I think at this point, Ralph is uh, more knowledgeable than I, I'd just say, we look at it at, as um, those types that are binding, uh, so there's antibody-based ones that are out there now that in trials, and non-binding, um, such as the one that we've developed. The, and Ralph, brilliantly, I think, and complimentary, uh, created um, 
the notion that we're really marking the physiology of the tumor and not so much concerned about uh, <coughs> binding to a particular cell. That gives us the ability to mark uh, the invasive cells uh, because we preferentially go to the uh, periphery and also the invading uh, immune cells. And I think that's a, uh, a major difference, a non-binding versus uh, binding type. Um, would you want to add something about? Yeah, so there are two separate issues, I would say. Number one is what is the targeting moiety? What are we targeting? Be it via aptamers, antibodies, peptides, small molecules, and so on. And secondly, what is the fluorochrome? How bright is the fluorochrome? And how much of the signal originates from the tumor versus the surrounding tissue in vivo? And so the challenge in vivo is very different from what pathologists have. Remember, in pathology, we basically put a labeled antibody on our tissue slide and then wash away everything that is non it's just adhered. And so there's very high target to background ratio, and that's why immunohistochemistry works so well. If we inject something intravenously, we can't wash away that nonspecific um, agent. So the challenge in vivo is designing imaging agents that get, that get cleared very quickly, but have yet very high affinity for whatever uh, their, their target is. And then, um, so th the second issue there is, um, in what wavelength um, do they fluoresce? And what is the, the signal? How bright are they? So obviously the brighter, the better. Uh, and uh, wavelengths towards the infrared is better. So with the ALA that's approved in Europe and pretty much the only one that's approved, it's a complex molecule that the body has to assemble to become a fluorochrome. So the precursor is not fluorescent. So First of all, one has to rely on the cell to actually assemble it, and then the final product, reminiscent of a porphyrin, um, is just not very bright. And, and so that's the challenge. And to put this on a scale, the imaging agents that are now being used, um, they're on the orders of 100 to 1,000 times brighter than the ALA. And so, so that's the difference. Great, thank you. Amy, you're chief medical officer of a, you know, fairly large corporation, large company, and it's, and which has been at the forefront of novel imaging devices and ways to detect, detect cancer at an earlier stage. Uh, in your view, what is, what is the most exciting technologies out there? What, five years from now, what can we see is going to be really revolutionary in terms of care of the cancer patient? Well, well, the truth is that you know Medtronic doesn't actually do that much work mm. in the area of cancer mm. specifically. Right. We're very device oriented. Mm. It so happens that, and I am a surgeon. I have a simple mind, mm -hmm. and so you know I always think about, uh, as you said, you know we're eager to just cut it all out and get out of the room, right? So I, I think for the group that I, um, that I work with most closely, which is on the more innovative mm -hmm. side and uh, earlier technologies, you know, we're really interested in using the technologies that other people have for this kind of imaging selectively in order to figure out how to access tissue. And so our imaging, some of it has to do with navigation. It has to do with software that allows us to navigate through the lung the same way a kid is playing a Star Wars game, basically, mm -hmm. and end up at a lesion without, um, without invading the body, basically, mm -hmm. going through natural orifices, figuring out how you can get to tissue. The tissue I obtain is critical for the diagnostic. And we're not yet into that diagnostic arena. We're really focused on trying to help the docs obtain the tissue they need without disrupting the natural environment and in places that have never been reached before um, without adverse events. So I think it's, for me, it's really exciting because things like lung cancer, which is an area that I do a fair amount of work in, uh, we know that the earlier we make a diagnosis, uh, the more testing we do on the tissue now, which is a world that's changing rapidly, the more personalized the medical care of that individual will be, and it's critical that they get the right amount of tissue. 
The trials have shown uh, now that if you go retrospectively back to the sources of tissue that have been obtained within the last couple of years through um, FNAs and other types of needle biopsies that there's not enough tissue there to do the testing. And so that's where our goal is right now. Uh, eventually, I think being able to navigate to tissue and being able to use um, good technology for imaging exact, um, exactly identifying where the tumor is will enable us to target that lesion for therapy through those catheters. So first it's getting the tissue, then it's understanding how to use those tools to uh, be for local treatment, for either ablation or for the use of drugs or therapies, uh, and to basically debulk where we need to, um, and then otherwise treat in the periphery. I'm fascinated by the idea of, of, um, of fluorescence in terms of identifying where uh, micro tumor exists, but I don't have any fantasy that we could remove it all. So I think we have to figure out how to do more and more earlier and earlier so that there's local tumor um, that's decreased enough to have an absolute impact on the timeline of the disease. I think one of the holy grails of these navigational systems is the so-called real-time imaging, yeah. because as you do things to the patient, things shift and change. And yes, and they, they breathe. And they so. breathe, and, uh, and it's very hard to How inconvenient. Yeah. Stop, <laughs> stop your procedure to get an image while you're doing that, and so having some real-time imaging, I think, is the holy grail. Uh, outside of ultrasound, which is what everybody does or thinks of doing, is there anything else out there that you can think? Uh, well, I think we're getting better with CT scanners. Yeah. Um, they're not exactly real time, but we can get them closer and closer to the patient. And like I said, that's not uh, what I do in my group. But I think our, the success of our technologies are dependent upon the utilization of things that get, that get closer and closer to real time. Uh, so ultrasound is, you know, is the best that we have, but we can modify ultrasound in ways that it can be used uh, on tissue that we've never used it before. Doing, using ultrasound on lung is very hard to do, uh, but there are other ways to use that technology. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you, Maurice, uh, which is, you know, your, your technology seems very interesting because it sounds like you can do things to disrupt, um, uh, open up passageways, particularly in the brain, let's say opening up the blood brain barrier, but you can also ablate tissue, so it's got this bilateral combined uh, modality. Uh, I see its value in the brain, but for other cancers and other parts of the body, do you really need, does, does uh, you know, would using ultrasound uh, to open up vasculature or to uh, allow more permeability, is that going to be useful? So, so I would I would say you know, we've identified over over 50 diseases and, and organs to go to go to to address with this technology uh, with focused ultrasound and and just to describe the concept, it's it's a it's a it's a it's an amazing idea in that in that you have the ability inside an MR machine to image any part of the body. And then what you're able to do in a very elegant way with transducers of ultrasound and using acoustic energy, you can, you can all of a sudden, like a magnifying glass, be able to increase the temperature at a millimetric level, any, any part, and be able to move that beam without destroying any tissue in its way. And then you're also able to measure the thermometry and create a closed loop system. So anywhere in the body, you can actually now be able to, to be able to do some type of treatment and then all of a sudden be able to measure and then take the, the final image to determine that you've, you've said what you're going to do. So a lot of these things about move, movement and motion as MR becomes more advanced and more real time, all of a sudden these things start to become more and more visible and a real way of dealing with these types of uh, applications. What's interesting that's happened over the last, I would say, a uh, few years has been this concept of not just using it to burn or to ablate, but also just to stimulate. And, and the stimulation is in the form of creating these things called cavitation or using microbubbles to enable you to all of a sudden open up things like the brain.
and in terms of opening up the tight junctions, where you're doing it in a non-invasive way, uh, where it lasts three, three to five hours, and you can actually now start put, pulling, put molecules in that you normally wouldn't be able to put into the brain. And I, and I think that um, this now enables you to create a platform. So one of the things that I think is very promising in things outside of the brain is going to be targeted therapy. In that, in the sense is that now, it, when you ha when you look at different types of drugs, and you can imagine um, a, a drug with a liposome around it, and then all of a sudden, if it's if it's in its normal form, it's going to be it's going to cause toxicity anywhere in the body. But all of a sudden, in a very targeted area where you've identified where the lesions are, where the cancer is, you can target this energy, and then you can basically be able to put high concentrations of something into that targeted area. And I think that is one of the areas, if you see in the next 10, 10, 20 years, is gonna be very exciting in terms of being able to look at targeted therapies and using this technology to enable you to do this in a very non-invasive way. Thank you. Uh, so as surgeons, we are um, interested in taking out things by ourselves with a microscope, or you know, with suction devices, or whatever we use, but it sounds like there's this various ways of tumor ablation that we discussed, uh, thermal energy, cavitation, um, um, ultrasound. Um, if you had to choose one way to kill tumor cells, what would you use, Amy? Is there one particular thing, one particular method of ablation? Well, I think, um, I think the goal with ablation is control. Uh, you know, the, the, the difficulty with ablation is that as you apply heat, it changes, right? Mm -hmm. The tissue changes, and so the spread of the heat changes, and it gives you a variability in your ablation zone that's not controllable. And so you want something that's agnostic to tissue density, agnostic to temperature, uh, uh, theoretically agnostic to air or any kind of surrounding um, fluid, liquid. So, um, you know, one of our products uh, called Thermosphere's microwave ablation was developed specifically with this intention, and I think, uh, and we're in the early stages of looking at outcomes with this, but I, I think it, it, it was developed with that in mind, that there are all kinds of ablation technologies, RFA and um, different kinds of ultrasound or microwave, but we have to keep in mind the goal. The goal is to, as you said, with ultrasound, to pinpoint something to be able to target it, treat it, remove it, and be sure that what we have treated was predetermined and as close to that pre predetermination as possible. On top of this, we need imaging that will enable us to get to that pinpoint and hold to that pinpoint while we're blading. So real-time imaging. So the combination of these two things is what we're looking for. And I, I'm not sure, and we're not there yet. We're a lot closer and we have a, a lot more experience with, um, with microwave than we ever had before. Um, certainly there's a vast amount of experience with RFA in different parts of the body and, and for ablation. Uh, so I think, there's, I think we still have a way to go with this. But there's a lot of uh, promise uh, with microwave. You know, I, I think that the, the combination of real-time imaging to be able to validate yeah. is so critical in, in this process. And at least from our perspective, one of the big things, the breakthroughs that we were able to do is to be able to put this technology inside an MR machine, which is not, not a trivial task. And not only that, but I think also some of these uh, ablation techniques, I don't think there's going to be anything that's going to be great for everything, right? There's going to be some stuff that works in some areas. And, and, and I think, for example, ultrasound doesn't work well, as we know, in the lung. So, in, so, so we know that um, you know, one of the things that we were able to figure out very quickly was how to put ultrasound beams through, through a skull, which is, which, is, which, is a, which is unbelievable that we can kind of get all these 1,000 elements of energy kind of going through the skull that's being absorbed, energy being absorbed, and all of a sudden all conforming through these phase arrays all into one pinpoint that is kind of millimetric in, in, in the ability to, uh, to do a lesion inside the brain. So there's a lot of advancements that are taking place in this field, um, but I think the real-time imaging modality and having things like fluorescence and being able to enhance and detect and determine where this is, this is where I think devices are gonna play an important role in this whole treatment of cancer 
And, and I think what's gonna be very exciting, and I think the challenges in front of us is how to combine it with therapy, with, with drugs, mm -hmm. with, with uh, biologics, with antibodies, some of the things that we're hearing in this conference. You know, and I think it's, it's gonna be that combination. And just to make a, a very important point is that we have a long ways to go, not only in terms of getting the funding to do these types of combined therapies, but we're in a society where, um, in, for example, in Washington, in, you know, these guys, a lot of people that are making policies and regulating things are struggling with how to do combined therapies of devices and drugs. So we have, we have to kind of get through those hurdles as well. But I think it's an area that, that there needs to be more attention and focus on. You know, I, uh, you touched on what I think uh, is a little story uh, for us. About three years ago, we were looking at going beyond breast into ovarian, metastatic ovarian, which if you know that is like popcorn all over the peritoneal cavity. And the surgeon said just that. He said, what I really need is something that can not only image, because that's what we were doing, uh, but can ablate because uh, there was a couple of things. One, these were once again fall, uh, very small foci. Um, there were many of them, so it was time consuming. Uh, and you wanted to spare the tissue uh, that it was sitting on, you know, the, uh, the various uh, tissue. And <clears throat> so we did uh, undertake that. And we've, you know, it's very early stage, but we combined a laser ablation, which gave us the, the precision of uh, the depth and the width. Um, it's not, it would, at least our configuration, would never be useful in a bulk tumor. I mean, it would take a long time, uh, but for little foci all over, um, I think it's a, that's a good application for um, a pinpoint laser guided by the, um, the fluorescence. And the nice thing in, in, case, in the case of the laser is we needed to uh, make sure the debris from the ablation uh, didn't disrupt uh, what our, our uh, uh, fluorescent image would give us, and it didn't. So as it uh, took away the tumor, we, could, we, would be image, we are imaging in real time, and there's a decision then that's made to go deeper. But it's very early. It's, this was only in mice. Go ahead. Yeah. Am I allowed to ask a question? Too? Please. Oh, okay. So from an interventional radiology perspective, um, during a typical busy day where we have 20 minutes to half an hour per patient at the most, um, sometimes if we get lucky up to an hour. Um, we usually battle with two to three issues, uh, no matter what the energy is that we put in, be it microwave, be it um, RFA, or, or be it something else. And that is, number one is whenever a lesion is close to a vessel, that vessel acts as a heat sink. And so whatever thermal energy I deposit, it just gets washed away. And so the, so the therapy adjacent to vessels is just not the same as if there are no vessels. Now, you all know that there's angiogenesis around tumors, so that's by its problem. The second one is whenever we deliver energy, our tumors are sometimes much larger than the spread of that energy from, from its epicenter. And so it can take quite some time to treat. So my question to the panelists would be, what is in the works um, to treat larger cancer? So not the ideal one centimeter lesions, but the three centimeter, four centimeter liver lesions. Um, is there anything uh, on the horizon? And the third problem is, in the lung, it's very clear, but in the abdomen and the liver and kidneys and so on, tumor margins are usually not that distinct. And so particularly after energy deposition, we don't know exactly where to stop. And, and, and then when patients come back, is there inflammation? Is there residual tumor? It's the same in the brain. And so it's a real conundrum sorting out what's cancer and what's um, inflammation. So I don't know if <laughs> so, <laughs> it's I mean, a loaded can, question, but. <laughs> I can at least yeah. talk from, from our perspective some of the things that at least I'm excited about. I think it's still very early, but I think it's very exciting is, is the area of it's, and once again, it's this theme of a combination of. And I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a so, so the idea 
that we're looking at, the concepts that we're looking at, is being able, in a non-invasive way, to be able to first ablate mm -hmm. with energy and heat and destroy the tissue that we know, the tumors that we know that we want to try to attack, okay? And then the next step that we're thinking, and, and we're actually, we have a study, we have an open study right now, a phase one study on this, is being able, and we're doing it with glioblastomas, and the idea there is we first ablate the tumor, and then what we want to do is we want to go around the margins and being able to open up the blood brain barrier and then deliver something. In this case, in the study that we're doing, we're doing it with doxorubicin. And being able to kind of say, can, you know, can you put something in combination with the drugs? And I think that area, that theme is something. And then, it, then being able to detect it and determine whether you've done, you've done it. And then go into kind of the active surveillance mode in terms of figuring out how to do that across the board in different types of diseases across the board. I mean, I think that is kind of the, the way that we're looking at it. And I think that is that combination that I think has a lot of potential and what gets us excited in SciTech. Are there fluorescent molecules or fluorescent processes that you could think of that can sharply delineate tumor from normal tissue? Sharply. Um. <laughs> or exactly, or? Um, or does it matter? So, well, first off, it's, it's awfully hard to prove that even if you set that experiment up, uh, you, it's rare that you can really prove that in a human. Uh, we did it with uh, dropping cells um, on, a, on tissue, and, you know, yeah, we could see those cells versus the others. But, um, you know, that's a difficult uh, experiment. Um, what, what I think we find is that uh, we get great contrast between uh, the tumor and healthy tissue. Um, and as I said before, we differentially um, uh, go, go to the um, invasive front because of the vasculature of the tumor, the penocytosis of the, those cells, um, and then also the invading macrophage, all these things help create um, a good boundary for us. Um, it's still going to be a gradual change to the, um, to the healthy tissue. What we found, at least uh, in the data we had so far, which is limited, is that, that that boundary is still on the order of microns, 500 microns or so, uh, a half a millimeter. And so, you know, honestly, I consider that pretty sharp. Uh, when the uh, breast cancer surgeons are taking um, a half a centimeter uh, on each shave, um, we are defining the boundary as a small fraction of that. But, you know, this is on a limited population. We'll have to see what uh, the next cohort looks like. But yeah, you can get pretty close. To answer your question, I like the idea that um for large tumor masses, we still don't, you know, maybe, maybe the ultrasound helps, but uh, we still don't have a good way of dealing with those, and therefore, you yeah. still need a surgeon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are, there are, um, in the liver, for example, you don't want to resort to the surgeon too quickly because you want to reserve some of that <laughs> nice liver tissue, right? We all know that it doesn't take that much liver to keep you going, and it's probably liver that does you in a lot of the time. And so local tumor ablation in the liver is particularly critical for a lot more than just liver disease, right? No question. Sure, sure, sure. So, you know, I think, that, I think learning how to use these technologies repeatedly mm -hmm. is, is one of the keys here, is figuring out how to use a technology that's non-invasive. So it's not causing harm while it's doing some good. And so you're, so the comfort level with repeating your mm -hmm. utilization goes up. You can, treat, uh, you can treat a tumor site. You know, I have this discussion all the time with my team. How much is enough? Do you really need that margin? If you're gonna do damage, why not basically debulk with your ablation, come back, use resist criteria, figure out where your margins are, what you think they are, to the point where you can come back and do another treatment and maybe another one and turn it into some kind of chronic disease. And I think this is really what we're looking at in terms of combining a surgical approach with an, a non-invasive approach, a chemical approach, 
an immunotherapy. I mean, what are the ways? It is possible that when you destroy tissue, you stimulate some other response. Mm -hmm. It's certainly possible that you could bathe that site at the end of your ablation with some other treatment uh, if you could deliver it through the same catheter. And so I think that's kind of the, where the art comes in at this point. And, and most of the IRs I work with that do liver are artists. I mean, they, they really, uh, you know, there's no exacting science to it. I would say that the technology we have is agnostic to tissue density, but also to the heat sink. Mm -hmm. And so in theory, you can use uh, this particular microwave device right up close to vessels without losing your, um, the density of your, t the power in your uh, burn. So we'll get there, but it's, you know. And I think you brought up a very important issue, which is toxicity. And for, you know, for anybody that's interested in drug development or biologics development, that's, a, that's also the holy grail. That's what usually stops your treatment in phase one or phase two trials, even at, at the right. moderate level. What toxicities are you worried about? You discussed some. Which are devices? You know, I, I worry about, um, I worry about uh, uh, patients' comorbidities more than anything else. I think that you can develop a perfect device to ablate a lung tumor. You can navigate your way to the tumor. You can ablate the tumor. If the patient um, has that tumor because they're a smoker and has bad emphysema, their outcomes are totally different than somebody that has a metastatic tumor and doesn't have that same kind of comorbidity. And so this is where the art comes in. And we don't always have clinical data that can be subgrouped that way. Uh, and, it, and it will take us a long time before we get there uh, because of the adverse events associated with patients' comorbidities. So our toxicity spectrum is really different than uh, somebody who's looking at chemotherapeutics or systemic treatments. It's more the doctor's obligation to be honest with that patient and themselves about how extreme those com comorbidities are and whether they do more harm than good in the end about for what toxicities do you worry about? Which, well, um, the things that you things study that we, or the... Uh, early on, when we were working with Ralph in the be very beginning, uh, and we had an interview with the FDA, they made it pretty clear that at that time that um, an approach such as ours, uh, which they did not at that time uh, consider therapeutic, um, though I think that's changing, uh, they said there can be no side effects. So um, we, we went down the path um, of... You mean zero side effects? Mm -hmm. Zero. Um, and so we went down the path of designing a molecule, which I always like to quote when we sat down with our IND with the first round with the FDA and the tox toxicologist of the FDA was sitting there and he said, oh, that's a nice little puppy. And I thought, oh, well, we're on the right path. <laughs> and so, you know, the downside of that is that we never reached a toxic limit. So, um, you know, we started up, we got up to 10 times therapeutic in, in the animals. And, and, you know, for those that have done this, you know that that consumes a lot of drug. And uh, we ultimately had to go to 70 when we finally gave up. Um, you know, that was a small downside. But I'm glad we chose that path. Um, I think now, in the interactions that we've had recently, I think they are probably, um, uh, they might have lowered that hurdle a little. This was three years ago. And for the ultrasound device, what I, are the... You know, I, I think we look at more adverse events that occur, and uh, not so much on the toxicity side, but in terms of if, you, if you're putting that type of energy into the body, um, what can it do in the surrounding tissue, or what if you miss? So things like ischemia are important for us in terms of being able to kind of manage that. Cavitation is another thing that could be pretty dangerous in terms of thing, seeing things explode inside, especially the brain. So, so you know, uh, uh, perforations. I think we we have a we we work with uh, in in the GYN space with uh, uterine fibroids, and so we're, we're really nervous about perforating uh, the bowels. Um, and that's why it's so important to have a closed loop system and being able to really kind of know when these things start to happen that the system really warns you. And that's why it takes so long to develop this type of technology. 
uh, rightfully so. I mean, you don't want this thing to go out there without having some really uh, rigor behind it. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of our focus has been around trying to understand those adverse events and the different types of energies that you can, you can put inside the body and what impact it has. Ralph, you've seen a lot of, uh, tested a lot of these technologies in your laboratory and animals and you know what the patient situation is. What are the adverse events or toxicities that you worry about? Or Well, um, it's bleeding crashing, more bleeding, <laughs> and these things usually happen. Um, uh, I mean, I agree with you. There, there are patients um, who just have the wrong protoplasm and everything has to be right uh, before we even go in. But I'm just worried by the stochastic nature of these things happening, you know, a garden variety, um, two centimeter lesion and the patient ends up bleeding and there was no vessel in sight. I mean, I, I, how does one explain that? And it, it, that's what, what really worries me. And it's also applied for the industry, for the device makers, you know, is there a way by which I can seal a track as you remove the needle or microwave probe or the biopsy gun or whatever? that would eliminate the bleeding from the track. I mean, this would be a huge boon um, to, um, to the medical space. Well, that's so, what we do with Focus Ultrasound. Uh, we don't have a track. You don't have a track, that's right, right. but everyone else right. does. Uh, well, you do, don't, but you know, biopsy, <laughs> right. for example. Right. You know, and every patient gets biopsy these days. Right. And not only one biopsy, but now we're doing high content biopsy, which means every cancer patient has at least six to 10 cores taken right. for each biopsy. And then and these, often these biopsies are repeatedly every month, not in the brain, but everywhere else in the periphery. Right. Um, and, and that's where complications um, happen. And there's no other way around, because otherwise we can't do the genomic analysis and all the other Got things. It. Uh, as uh, you know, we have a few more minutes left, and uh, you know, we talk about devices, um, and these are usually costly enterprises. We can't have a discussion here without discussing expense and cost, uh, especially nowadays. Um, and I, I'm sure that each one of these devices that you work with, or the types of devices you work with, are fairly expensive to make, are fairly expensive to uh, develop, and then uh, will probably cost quite a bit to the whoever buys them, usually hospitals, uh, medical centers. Uh, how, do you, how do you envision that part of the equation? How, is the, uh, how, does, how does that help um, uh, your, your selling? How do you market that type of technology in that sense? Good question. David. So, as I said in the very beginning, I'm, I'm a device guy. Yeah. And from day one, we thought about uh, the customer, their requirements, and we always had cost as an issue. So we made a lot of choices early on on the device to make sure that in the end, it was going to be imminently affordable uh, and that we could price it um, if we had to uh, near cost uh, because we're gonna be reimbursed with the drug and uh, we also chose a design that could be easily scaled, which we've done um, and uh, have that be well within um, a fraction of the uh, savings on the second surgery. So if you just look at um, breast cancer, 30% of those are repeated. Uh, so you can kind of take the, uh, the typical cost of uh, breast cancer surgery, take 30% of that, and that's the margin that we would be helping the hospitals save. And any of the hospitals uh, that are in bundled services or affordable care, they're seeing those second surgeries as costs, not incomes. So they are very keen to see the second surgery eliminated. So, and that number is many times greater than the cost of our drug uh, and device. So uh, that's why we chose breast as a starting point. It gets a little more complicated when we move to brain. Um, it's, you're not saving on a second surgery as much as extending life, uh, more complicated equation. 
imaging, ablation, uh, the things you work with seem to be going to be really, really costly. Are you going to be able to manage those costs? I, you know, I, I don't think, I think when we develop the products, we do the same thing. We develop a product that we think we can sell in a price range that's reasonable and matches to some kind of reimbursement models, or else there would be no point in doing it. But I, I think that the key here is really trying to model your economics based on patient outcomes. And, and really understand, like you said, what are you, sa what are you saving for who? You're, you have the patient, so you're saving the patient what? You're extending their life, say, okay? So you can't really model the cost of that. What you can model is the cost of repeat surgeries or um, adverse event outcomes, uh, major surgery versus minimally invasive applications, um, side effects. So you can, you can cost model this way out. And I think it's the obligation for sure in an industry like mine that sells this much device to develop and have in-house that kind of expertise for modeling. And we don't go to, uh, I mean, I don't sell. I'm, I'm in the mm -hmm. medical affairs arm. But we don't sell into a situation without having an accurate model there. And those, model, those models are um, critically assessed for integrity before they go out. And we'll get a lot better at it because it's going to be required by all of the healthcare systems in Europe, Europe more than here. Um, but we're dealing with it in China and Japan. I, you know, I think it's our, it's cost, it's the new world of what's cost effective, right. and that's the key. Focus ultrasound sounds expensive. Um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think Amy's spot on. I mean, I think it's this is all about uh, understanding where healthcare is going, especially in this in this country. I mean, we don't have to go too far. What's going on here in Massachusetts and what's going to happen nationally, and I think a lot of what I've seen in my prior life of, for example, the, the robotic surgery is a good example. Uh, robotic surgery really was driven, in, in my view, uh, on a on a revenue model um, where hospitals fought against other hospitals to be the first in the block to do robotic prostatectomies, for example. And it was a, it was kind of a turf battle, if you will, of bringing those patients into the system in the hospital. I think as we go further and further into where healthcare is going, it is it's gonna go in the opposite direction. It's gonna be episodic care. So you really have to kind of understand the dynamics uh, early on of what you're doing for whom and how is it impacting the cost of providing that services. And, I, and I'm seeing more and more conversations going on uh, with the providers specifically and the payers. They're, they're starting to really get it. Um, we're not there yet. I think we have a long ways to go. Um, but we're, we, we kind of, from my perspective, you know, that's what, that's what I'm thinking about as we kind of launch all these products uh, with Focus Ultrasound is kind of understand that model and how it's going to reduce the cost of the healthcare system. I know that when, whenever I have to buy, oh, I don't buy, but whenever I have to propose to my hospital buying the newest, call it fancy toy, we have to come up with this five-year business plan right. where you know, we actually show that it sounds expensive, but it's actually going to reduce ultimately costs and improve patient care. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think this is, this has become the new reality. Ralph, have you? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I fully agree with you. We, we certainly have to do the same thing. Okay. Um, I would add to all of this that the hospital billing is so non-transparent uh, to me or to anyone, or any of my <laughs> colleagues who practice medicine. <laughs> so it's hard to understand where, how expensive things really are. So we have one minute left. I know one of our speakers has to catch a plane. Is there any questions from the audience that, um, uh, for this great group of panelists? Crystal clear. Crystal clear. Oh. Crystal clear. Or else I will uh, thank you all for your attendance and uh, thank our panelists for their great time.